Good afternoon. We are, we are very lucky to have a special um, lunch speaker with us today. Uh, he doesn't really need an introduction, and in fact, he has an introduction, um, a bio in our program. But uh, Donald Verrilli is a, you know, well known to all of us as a uh, solicitor general in the Obama administration uh, uh, up until this past June probably best known for his successful defense of the Affordable Care Act in the court, uh, and also for his representation of the United States uh, in defense of uh, the constitutional recognition of same-sex marriage, among many other cases. Um, he has had an illustrious career as a, a, a lawyer and an, an appellate litigator in the private sector. And for the people who uh, are in the death penalty world, he's extraordinarily well known as a tireless and uh, effective advocate, in, as a pro bono advocate for death sentence inmates um, with uh, a long string of uh, representation in uh, the US Supreme Court and other courts uh, uh, in such cases. So we're very lucky to have him here today to talk about uh, his work on death penalty cases and as SG, and anything else you care to ask him about um, once I ask him a few questions. So we have, uh, we have a, we'll have a couple microphones that will be available. So as we chat, you can think about what you might like to ask uh, Don Verrilli while we have him here at our disposal. So I want to start. This is a death penalty conference. It's a death penalty day. So you know, let's start with some. Happy news. What do you think of as your biggest victory uh, in this area? You've litigated a yeah. bunch of these cases. So let me first say how delighted I am to be here. I'm so grateful that you asked me to do this. Um, it means a lot to me to have the chance here uh, so soon after being done with my time in the government to reintegrate myself into this community. Um, working uh, in this area with many of you here was by far and away the most fulfilling part of my uh, career in private practice before I went into the government. It means a huge amount to me to have had the chance to do that work, and it means a huge amount to me to be able to reintegrate and hopefully to continue to work with many of you here uh, going forward. So I'm really, really happy to be here. And you know what I would say in terms of my um, uh, cases when I was in practice involving clients on death row, um, I did uh, quite a number of them, and, that, and they weren't all successful. But, um, but the one that means the most to me, and as I think about it, I probably, in my career, uh, it, it is as important to me as the two things you mentioned, the defense of the health care law and the marriage equality issue, was a case um, ended up in the Supreme Court, uh, was ended up uh, in the Supreme Court under the title Wiggins versus Smith. Uh, for a client named Kevin Wiggins, who I began representing you know, back in the early 1990s. And the, um, it was a case of a fellow, I'm sure some of you in this room know, Russ Cannon. Uh, he, before he went on the bench in the Superior Court in DC, he came to me and said, I've got this uh, guy on death row in Maryland. I'm going to take the case on. Would you co-counsel it with me? And I said, sure. And then about three weeks later, he called me and said, guess what? I'm going to be a judge. The case is yours now. <laughs> and, <laughs> So, so I had the case, and I took it on. I had a really great team together at my old law firm, Jenner and & Block, and we uh, dug in, did a lot of research, did the state post-conviction proceedings, uh, which lasted several years. And um, it was a case, ultimately, about uh, ineffective assistance of counsel at sentencing based on um, lack of adequate investigation. And, we, you know, we dug in and we found, as one always does in these cases, an extraordinary trove of information about uh, this guy Kevin Wiggins' background, uh, and you know, the, just the extraordinary stress under which he grew up and the kinds of deprivations, just horrible deprivations that he was subject to as a child and a teenager and throughout his life, really. Uh, and we pulled all this together, and we then had our state post-conviction proceeding, and it was up in Baltimore County, Maryland, and put on this case. And the trial judge, the state habeas judge, ruled from the bench. He said, yes, you've demonstrated 
Uh, the, pre the, uh, the performance part of ineffective assistance of counsel, I'm going to take prejudice under advisement. So we were pretty happy at that point. And then two and a half years later, an opinion came out from him <laughs> in which he denied relief, finding that the performance was perfectly adequate. <laughs> um, so then we sort of worked our way through the state system. We filed a federal habeas petition some years later and in front of Judge Motz on the district court in Maryland. And Judge Motz ruled for us not only on the sentencing ground of ineffective assistance of counsel, but also found that there was insufficient evidence from which a reasonable jury could have uh, found him guilty. And so that was quite something. And then we went from there to the Fourth Circuit. And this, you know, at this point, we're like nine years in, eight or nine years in on the case. And we went to the Fourth Circuit. And those of you who have argued in the Fourth Circuit know you don't know who your panel is going to be until the morning of the argument. And the Fourth Circuit. Um, that her, this case, Kevin's case, was not the Fourth Circuit that we have now. Um, and so it was one of those things. I walked into the clerk's office that morning, and I saw, the, I saw who my panel was. And I said, oh, well, he's dead. Um, and so we had an oral argument went on and on and on. And many months went by. And sure enough, we got an opinion um, overturning Judge Motz both on the guilt-innocence phase and on the sentencing phase. And, um, but we did get separate opinions. Uh, uh, Judge Wilkinson wrote an opinion saying, you know, I can't say that we should, we, uh, there's enough here on habeas to overturn uh, the finding of guilt, but boy, is this a close case. Maybe the governor should uh, consider clemency. And then another judge um, wrote an opinion saying, well, there wasn't quite enough here to find ineffective assistance of counsel, but it was really close. <laughs> and uh, so then we filed a cert petition. And you know, cert petitions in death cases alleging ineffective assistance of counsel, they like, you know, there are a lot of those. And they almost never get granted. And then a, a miracle occurred. The case it got granted uh, and was argued in the spring of uh, 2003 and came down in, uh, in June of 2003 on the same day that Lawrence against Texas came down. And my then colleague, Paul Smith, had argued uh, Lawrence against Texas. So the two of us um, had quite a day that day. And, um, and amazingly enough, it was a 7 to 2 opinion. Uh, even the Chief Justice uh, voted to find an effective assistance of counsel. And it was one of those things. I, I sort of knew that was going to happen um, because of the oral argument. Um, and I'll pick up on this morning's Tony Amsterdam theme. One of the things I would do in all my death cases when I had an appellate argument was make sure I went up to New York and do a moot court with Tony. And so I did that for this case. And you know, the, the issue under AEDPA, of course, is, you know, is there well-established Supreme Court precedent that, that has been you know, either ignored or unreasonably applied? And so I was doing my moot with uh, Tony Amsterdam. And you know, he's pressing me on this. Well, you know, what's the, where's the clearly established precedent? Where's the clearly established precedent? And I was floundering around, you know, trying to say this and that and the other thing. And then in our discussion after the moot, Tony says, you know, Don, really, it's this sentence right here in Strickland. This is what you need to say. And so, OK, I absorbed it. Went into the oral argument, got started. And like five minutes in, Chief Justice Rehnquist says, so you say this is this clearly established precedent. What is it? You know, with this very skeptical, almost sneering kind of tone. And I was able to say, well, Mr. Chief Justice, it's right here on page 642 in the second paragraph. Here's the sentence. And of course, it was just Tony Amsterdam talking. And then, and then he kind of sat back. Rehnquist sat back in his chair. And the very next thing he asked me was about the prejudice issue in the case. <laughs> so I went, whoa. I was standing at the podium. I went, holy moly. I think he might vote for me. And then, and then sure enough, he did. So it was, it was an amazing thing, as I said. It, and when I think of the things in my career that kind of define it for me, that, that case really was, was uh, up there. Well, I completely agree with you that it, it was an amazing thing, because you say you thought you might win. That makes one of us. Because <laughs> I was teaching capital punishment law at the time, and I remember you know, the, the briefs were in before your oral argument, so I used the case for my class, and I had the class like 
do a mock argument in my class about Wiggins versus Smith. And I, when it was done, they say, so Professor Steiger, what do you think is going to happen? I said, Don Verrilli is going to lose big. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to lose big. And the reason I thought that is, and this is why Wiggins is such an extraordinary precedent, is that unlike prior cases where the court actually upheld attorney performance as adequate, in cases where there's a case, my students have read it, Berger versus Kemp, a somewhat earlier generation, where the lawyer introduced no evidence in mitigation for his client, nothing, nothing at all. And the Supreme Court upheld that um, as adequate. In Wiggins versus Smith, these were you know, a couple of well-regarded uh, public defenders in Maryland who did a decent job. In prior cases, the court said, well, if the attorney has a strategy, and that's the reason why they made the choices to do or not do whatever they did, well, that will generally be sufficient. These lawyers actually had a pretty good strategy. They said, we're not really all that interested in um, Wiggins' terrible um, childhood. Um, because our, our theory in, in sentencing is residual doubt about his guilt. Because as you can tell from, yeah. from Don's description of the yeah. case. There was, was some residual doubt about his guilt. There was some residual yeah. doubt because yeah. there was yeah. no yeah. eyewitnesses. There were, you know, there was, yeah. It was a totally circumstantial case. He was kind of near working around the apartment complex where this happened. Um, there was physical evidence that apparently the perpetrator left on the scene that didn't match Wiggins. Um, this was residual doubt was pretty good. Um, and the, a lot of the mitigating evidence that, um, that was turned up on State Polk's conviction had a lot to do with Wiggins having been horribly sexually abused as a, as a young person. And although this was not a rape case, it was a murder case, it had weird sexual overtones to it. The victim was found semi-clothed um, in a bathtub. And so I thought, like, one, like strategy, wasn't crazy strategy. And two, even if it was deficient, what about prejudice, right? Like, wouldn't the jury think anyone who'd had this horrible history of sexual abuse would be the kind of person who would leave a victim semi-clothed in a bathtub? So that's why that was my prediction that this case was going south. What's amazing is that Don won the case. He won it seven to two. It was a case post-EDPA, so a habeas case in which deference had to be accorded to state court findings. And it's really important for the law. So this case not only says, you know, you really have to investigate these cases. Um, and the lawyer who fails to do that does so at his or her peril. But it also said something really interesting about prejudice, recognizing that in Maryland, as in most states, a single juror's vote for life is enough to make a life sentence. And so the court said, in thinking about whether the defendant was prejudiced by the failure to introduce this mitigating evidence, we have to ask ourselves whether even a single juror might have been swayed by this, something the court had never said before. Yeah. Yeah. So just want to underscore from someone who predicted 100% wrong how this case <laughs> would come out, what a significant. Um, well, the key, the key thing was that to sort of try to, the key move was to try to just shift their focus from the, whether it was a reasonable course of action to use residual doubt as the strategy at sentencing to a step earlier in the process to say you can't make a reasoned judgment about what the right strategy is unless you've investigated enough first to have a basis for making the judgment. And that, I mean, that was the thing. It was a little bit drawing to an inside straight, I realize, but uh, that was, but the, that line was the, too, the line too from Strickland, right? Yes, and that was the line from Strickland, right? Right. right. That was the Tony Amsterdam fact, right? So, well, that was amazing, and just shifting the conversation. That was an amazing win, but you know, you can't work in this area without losing. Right? I mean, it's just like they're, you know, amazing wins like that are, are not the bread and butter of anyone who does death penalty work. So, can you tell us a little bit about some cases you didn't win? Yeah, so I, uh, two cases in front of the Supreme Court that I lost. Um, one was a case called Landrigan, which was in about, I don't know, 2006 maybe. Uh, that was another ineffective assistance of counsel case. It was another one of these cases about making an argument about failure to investigate. Um, uh, and we lost at 5-4. Uh, 
the, you know, the, there are two key differences between Landrigan and Wiggins, though, um, and that explain the, the change in outcomes, I think. One was that whereas Wiggins was, you know, in, in, the, in this world in which you operate, Wiggins was a particularly sympathetic defendant. He had no criminal record. He had this horrible history. Um, and, you know, he had, you know, as these things go, his case was pretty well postured. Landrigan was not like that. Um, and in fact, there was one point in the sentencing proceeding in front of the judge where he was resisting having uh, mitigating evidence put on on his behalf. And, um, and the judge said to him, well, you know, you're very likely to get a death sentence if you don't have the mitigating evidence put on on your behalf. And he said, well, bring it on, Your Honor. So we were kind of in a hole there in that case. Um, but the second reason was by the time that case uh, came before the court, Justice Alito had replaced Justice O'Connor. And so, which in, you know, in this area made a gigantic difference because Justice Alito's vote was virtually never available in this kind of a case, whereas Justice O'Connor's vote was sometimes available. And so that was, um, that was one loss. The other one was the first of the lethal injection cases, Bayes, which I argued. And that was, that was a really rough case to do. I got brought into that case after cert had been granted, um, came out of Kentucky. And it was grant, that case was, cert was granted in that case based on a cert petition that had focused on a medical article that was in circulation then about lethal injection uh, from the medical journal, The Lancet. And what, that, what the article indicated was that the three drug cocktail used uh, in these executions, just as a matter of uh, pharmacology, would not work, did not work, and that uh, defendants were invariably subjected to excruciating pain. So we kind of dug in on that and uh, hired like the foremost pharmacologist person in the world with expertise in this area and read everything we could. And what we figured out was that that Lancet article just didn't hold up at all, at all. And if we went forward on it, we were going to get ripped to shreds. And so we changed our theory in front of the court from that to an argument based on um, the extreme likelihood uh, of, or extremely high probability in, in, a, in a material number of executions the process would be botched because it was such a Rube Goldberg process. And not just that it had three steps, but that you know, there are people behind curtains and tubes going here and there. And, um, and it came out of Kentucky. Kentucky had only had two executions, neither of which had shown any problems. And at that point, the track record of botched executions was a lot thinner than it is now. And uh, so it was, uh, it was an extremely tough argument. And of course, you know, the view expressed quite openly, although not quite as hostily as it was in uh, the more recent lethal injection case from last year or two years ago, was that, you know, you're just up here trying to throw sand in the gears. What, you know, what are you doing? Come on. This is a joke. And that was sort of the tone of it. Um, and so that was, that was another one that didn't, didn't uh, end up so good. Right. Well, it's interesting that, that you should raise Bayes versus Reese and the more yeah. recent one, Glossop versus yeah. Gross, which was decided in June of 2015. You know, what's interesting about those cases is in Bayes and in Glossop, the defense argument uh, against the lethal injection protocols failed. Despite yeah. that, you know, lethal injection litigation and, um, you know, gubernatorial stays and, and, and moratoria uh, it is slowing down. Those things are slowing down executions around the country. So the lethal injection issue has been a total loser in the Supreme Court. But it's had kind of stunning success in thro throwing yeah. sand in yeah. the gears yeah. and, and slowing down executions and stopping them in many jurisdictions. So just this is a little bit, you know, criticizing the framework of this whole day. I mean, this day is called the Supreme Court and Capital Punishment suggesting that the Supreme Court's really important in terms of capital punishment in its future. And yet, this lethal injection thing makes me question or ask you to think about, like, how important is the Supreme Court here? Um, yeah, no, I think that's why in, in Bayes and then in Glossop uh, some years later, 
Justice Scalia and Justice Alito were like borderline apoplectic up on the bench was because they understood exactly what you were saying, that you know, it really didn't matter in some ways what they said because there, was a, there were enough problems in terms of the importation of the drugs and enough botched executions causing state officials to pull back and, uh, and enough public scrutiny about it that it you know, made a big difference despite what they were saying. I, don't think, I think that's certainly true and it's certainly the cause of their frustration. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, before you became SG, all of your experience with regard to criminal justice was on the defense side. And, you know, then you become, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Government, a government lawyer. And, you know, all your experience in the SG's office is on the government side. So what, what was that like? And how did yeah. you, uh, you know, deal yeah. with the, what would the psychologists call it, cognitive dissonance? Dissonance, yeah. So it's, it's kind of related to the question that Randy asked this morning, you know, um, that, you know, partly it's, you know, you take the job, you sort of take it recognizing that, well, you know, you're going to work for the United States government, there is a death penalty, you're going to have to confront this issue a certain number of times. Um, for me, what happened was that I developed, a, I mean, I think the right word for it is respect. Uh, I developed a significant degree of respect for the seriousness and uh, good faith of the Justice Department lawyers who were involved in the process. And the process I saw was not the front end process of deciding whether to seek the death penalty, because that's all sort of, you know, an operation of the Justice Department that I didn't really plug into. I saw the back end of the process. You know, there had been a conviction and a sentence, and then it was coming up through the appeal process. And um, in the, uh, in a significant, in, in every one of those cases, I will say, to give, giving uh, credit where it's due to the lawyers in the department, it was an unbelievably thoughtful analysis that came to me, really carefully done, really well researched. And in a significant number of these cases, I don't know what the percentage is exactly, um, but, uh, but a significant number, a recommendation came to me to drop the appeal. And so there were a, a number of cases that came through the system during my tenure where the United States were, had, had lost at the district court level uh, in a federal death case and then did not appeal. And in none of those instances was it a decision by me to overrule the, the people uh, making the recommendation to me. In each case, it was a recommendation that came to me. And now, I will say it is possible that the people working in the system thought they had more air cover to make such a recommendation when I was SG. I think that's possible um, because I think I saw that play out in other related areas. Um, and there's sort of two things that we did when I was SG. We took a position uh, that not, is not death issues, but, but issues that you all know about. Under the Fair Sentencing Act, we took a position that the, the Fair Sentencing Act ought to apply retroactively, um, which was you know, in, in favor of the defendant. And then on the question of the retroactive application of the court's decision barring life without parole for juveniles, we took the position that that ought to apply retroactively too. And in both of those instances, that was the recommendation that came to me as SG. It wasn't my, me dictating it, but I do think it was because they felt like it could. Um, and then the other thing that happened too was that in the, you know, one, one thing you notice is that the United States in the, time I was SG, almost never participated in a death case. Um, and I think there was one instance where we did. And again, I think that was because people felt like they were in a, working in an environment where they didn't, it, it, they didn't need to recommend that the United States participate in order to satisfy the powers that be. So, so I think there were kind of effects like that. But the main thing was that I was, um, didn't change my view uh, about capital punishment. But it did give me a sense of respect for the people working on it in the process, at least, as I said, the back end of the process, which is the, you know, deciding what to do in the, once a conviction and sentence had been imposed. So. 
Very, I mean, very interesting. I mean, and, and in terms of particip when you say talk about participating, you mean participating in as, state as amicus, as right? Amicus, and right. Say because the SG's we office. We didn't have any federal death cases that went to the court during my time, and I right. think I think maybe there was one that we participated as amicus uh, in a state case. So. Right, because I mean, just in the story we've been telling this morning about the you know death and rebirth of the American death penalty, the SG's office when uh, Robert Bork was SG played a, a big role yeah. in um, in nineteen in the yeah. nineteen seventy six cases and bringing the death penalty back and filing an amicus on behalf of the United States uh, in favor of the yeah and, and in Wiggins the United States was in on the other side for me in that case so. uh, an even sweeter victory than I guess from yeah. from. Uh, from your position anyway. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of students here today at lunch. I wonder if you yeah. might say a word or two about students yeah. who look at your career and say, hey, that job sounds really good. If, if, if I want to be SG, right. so, what, what, what do yeah, I need so to do? Yeah, so this is really, um, you know, when I think about my career, um, it, you know, if you had, I, you know, when I, was, when I was your age, when I was young, I don't think I really even knew what an SG was. Um, I, you know, eventually I clerked for Justice Brennan. At that point, that's when I figured out I think what an SG was because I got to see the SG. Um, and I and I came out uh, in practice um, and started out in a, in a small firm in D.C. And I had, as a law clerk, it was in the mid 1980s, and it was a time when the actual pace of executions was ramping up. So we had all of these late night stay application fights and. You know, I came out of that process, and maybe that's what you know. You and Jordan had the sim similar kind of experience. Maybe I've never talked to you about it, but it was it was sort of that exposure to the process and just seeing how unfair it all was and how inadequate all the luring was. I really felt like I wanted to do something about it. So, like I just, a couple of months after I started practicing, what I did was call up Steve's organization, and they got me a case um, in Georgia, a guy named John Michael Davis, who we eventually got relief for after many years. Um, and I started working on that case, and then I, you know, I just took one after another after another of these cases. And, you know, the 1980s was not like now in terms of the public's perception of capital punishment. You know, these polls are now pretty close to 50-50, but in the 1980s it was like 80-20, you know, and it, it was a big time hot button issue. And so if you were a young lawyer thinking, I want to be Solicitor General someday, or I want to have, have some big fancy position where the, you have to go before the Senate and get confirmed, and you were thinking strategically about how to plan your career, the last thing you would have done was to take death penalty cases, the last thing, because you would have said, I'm just making a big giant issue for myself. But as I sit here and think back over my career, I am morally certain, morally certain that I would not have become SG had I not done that work. And that's true for two reasons. You know, before I went into the government, I had argued 12 cases in the Supreme Court, which you know, were the thing that gave me some, people some reason to think maybe I could be a good SG. Five of the 12 cases were death penalty cases. And so just the experience thing, um, I think, came out of this. And then, but, and, but the other piece of it was Geez, this is more than anything else growing up in my career. This is how I learned to be a lawyer. Because, you know, as a young lawyer, these were my cases. And, you know, I could call on people like Steve for advice and whatnot, but these were my cases. I had to, you know, go do the investigation in Columbus, Georgia, or Gulfport, Mississippi, or all these other places. And then I had to structure the arguments, and I had to think through. You know, which of these arguments is going to work, which isn't, what should I stress, what should I leave behind. And I had to make those judgments myself in situations in which the stakes were unbelievably high. And you know, it was through that process, more than anything else, I think, in my career that I really learned how to be a lawyer. And so you put those two things together, and I just have no doubt that the, the reason I ended up as SG was because I took on these cases, starting as a young lawyer. And I say that in particular because, you know, this. Uh, you saw what happened to Dave Oladigbele with, uh, with his nomination to be the head of Civil Rights Division. That was an outrage. And he got burned by something similar to this. So you know, people could look at that and, and take that as a cautionary tale to avoid commitment to anything controversial. But I really, really, despite that, and Dave himself would say this, despite that, the opposite is true. I, I think you're much more likely, in addition to being more fulfilled and feeling good about what you're doing, to advance yourself uh, if you take on these kinds of controversial, tough issues. 
That's great. Um, you know, I know I, my, my colleague and law school classmate, um, Bill Rubenstein, who's now on our faculty here and as a, you know, major uh, uh, figure in class action litigation, you know, early on when he graduated from law school in the mid-80s, he got very involved in um, AIDS work. Um, uh, the AIDS epidemic was at a crisis proportion, at crisis, you know, was a really an ongoing crisis in the in the mid 1980s and he felt compelled much in the way you described feeling compelled to go do death penalty work having seen it up close to do that and i remember he remembers someone telling him that's career suicide um you know he's now like a professor and big shot expert of class action like to, to turn out to be career suicide so i think a lot of people will tell you you know you should adhere to some well-worn path and it's just it's great to hear you know your story about following your inner compass your indignation and your interest to a field that you know brought you to where you are yeah today. in fact i think the least likely way to get to some place like being sg is to map out a strategic course <laughs> i think i think that's almost certain to fail so you can't even do it if you try. Right, yeah. Well, you know, one topic that's already come up uh, today, this is sort of a last topic before I want to open uh, the floor up to people's uh, questions, but talking about the future of the death penalty in this changing political landscape with the Supreme Court, you know, teetering in the balance and, you know, a new administration coming in, you know, people trying to predict what the future of the death penalty is. Do you think that a Vermin 2 lies in our future? So, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. And um, even before, I, I, and I think the, the election last week and what will follow from it makes this really complicated um, for reasons I'll, I'll try to lay out. Before the election, I was a skeptic uh, about the idea of trying to push uh, the, let's call it Furman II, up to the court fast. Um, I didn't think, you know, whether it was uh, Chief Judge Garland or somebody else going into that seat, I, I didn't think there were going to be five votes for it in the near term. And I thought that because, you know, you see Justice Breyer and, and Justice Ginsburg articulating this particular view now, but they're you know, very, very deep into their tenure on the court. And, you know, just as with Justice Stevens and Justice Blackman, this is something that they kind of came to and were willing to say very late in their careers and not very early. And I am less certain, not based on any inside information or anything, just sort of my own read on it, less certain that Justice um, Kagan and even Justice Sotomayor would be in that place at this early stage in their tenure on the court. Um, and, um, less certain that Justice Kennedy would be ready to do something, take this step, or particularly in the short term, because you know I just think with respect to marriage equality, having uh, written the opinion he wrote in Windsor on DOMA and taking all the flack he took for it, and then having written the opinion he wrote in Obergefell and taking all the flack for it, that he wasn't gonna be ready to do this anytime soon. In fact, he said something in a speech in the summer of 2015 about how the Supreme Court has a storehouse of credibility and it spends it down sometimes when it needs to and then it needs to build it back up. And I heard that and said, yeah, right. Um, and so I had been a skeptic about the idea of pushing this forward and thinking that it was maybe more along the like 10 to 20 year timeline that you were talking about um, this morning. I think the election complicates that though because while one doesn't know exactly how the next four years will unfold in terms of personnel on the court, one way to the, the, do the calculus now would be that, yes, the, it's the odds. I may, my, the analysis I just set out may be right that the odds may still be pretty long, but they may just get worse. And therefore, maybe it makes more sense to take the shot now rather than later, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's a really hard call, a really hard call. Well, reading the public statement he leaves, didn't Scalia before his death say he thought there were five votes on the court to get rid of the death penalty? He did. He did. He did. And you know, he was right about marriage. And so maybe, maybe he's right about that too. I don't know. 
But I, I don't, uh, just, you know, just, I'm just skeptical about it. Well, I, my credibility yeah. is already shot because I so, thought you would have lost Wigan. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> um, it, well, this has been great. Yeah. I want to give people here a, a chance to, to ask, uh, ask Don Verrilli whatever questions you like. We have yeah. microphones, um, two microphones, anyone uh, with a question? You're not going to get a chance with him yeah, again. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to answer questions on anything. Now that I'm not in the government anymore, it's a little easier. Got a so. question over here. Hi. Um, <clears throat> just really quickly, going to the point of even getting a Furman to, I mean, isn't the real issue that even in Furman, they didn't find that the death penalty itself was unconstitutional, but that the way it was being done was unconstitutional? I mean, I think something that is really difficult about doing Supreme Court constitutional litigation is that death penalty is directly in the Constitution. I mean, the wording is in the Constitution. I think it's hard to get the death penalty itself to be found unconstitutional. I think that's what you're looking for, um, is even farther than Furman, something that is completely... Well, maybe, maybe, that may be right, but it may also be that, you know, because of the you know, the great work that Jordan and Carroll did and, and the uh, opinion of Justice Breyer, which is uh, in, in Glossop, which is built on it somewhat, that there's, a, there's an, a place short of that, but sufficiently definitive that it, as a practical matter, uh, is, uh, you know, ends the death penalty. That it's not just that, you know, whatever one thinks about the underlying you know, moral questions of retribution and deterrence, that when you put together all the factors that Justice Breyer identified as coming out of the post-76, post-Greg experience, that we now know enough to know that this just can't be done in a manner that the Constitution will abide. That, you know, that doesn't require you to make the definitive kind of judgment that you're talking about, but it's, it'd be definitive enough, I think, to, to uh, end, end capital punishment. So I think that argument is there. Um, and, and I think it's been sketched out. Um, and, you know, and Justice Breyer invited it to be brought to the court. Um, it's just a question of timing, I think. Uh, since you're speculating, uh, what, are the, uh, what, what do you see the odds as what do you think the odds are of any commutations of federal death sentences in the next two months? Yeah, I don't know is the answer to that. I, I really don't have any idea. Um, so far, you know, the only, the only, I, I'm not part of, haven't, wasn't a part of that process. I don't have any great insight into it. I'm going to tell you something that probably you and everybody else in the room knows already. Um, one is, you know, obviously the focus of this process has been on nonviolent drug offenders, you know, and that's what they're trying to push through. Um, but two, you know, I know that they, the people running this process have said repeatedly that the door is open to requests for commutations uh, in death cases. And they've said that numerous times. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, the door may be open, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that you'll get relief if you walk through the door. I just, I just don't know. I just don't know. Short of a, a Furman II type of ruling, I'm wondering what you think um, as the best chances for Supreme Court litigation that's just sort of moving in piecemeal fashion. I mean, some people are talking about um, uh, proportionality review for mental illness. Um, some, you know, one could, I suppose, do a return back to the, to the racial disparities question. There's inequality geographically and everywhere else. And I just wondered, I mean, or you could go back to ineffective assistance of counsel. For those of us looking for the place to build short of a firm and two ruling? What do you think? So I haven't thought strategically about this in a long time. You know, I haven't studied it carefully, and so I haven't, it just hasn't been something I've been focused on. And so I'm just like totally shooting from the hip here, and it should be understood that I'm totally shooting from the hip, and this is not worth anything. <laughs> but, but it seems like the override issue seems to me, uh, you know, to have some real bite to it. Um, you could see that, that that is an incremental step that doesn't 
invalidate uh, capital punishment everywhere, and it's something only in Alabama, right? And it's just something that really seems wrong with that, you know. Um, and so that that seems like a possibility. You know, the mental illness proportionality thing seems like a possibility to me too. Then you'll have to fight about what the definition of mental illness is and, and whatnot. But you could see a, a, a court that still has Justice Kennedy on it. You could see that five votes maybe uh, maybe uh, for that proposition. And, but then beyond that, I, I really haven't thought about it uh, carefully enough to give you a good answer. So. Well, I'm happy to answer more questions if anybody has any. I, could you talk a little bit about the role of lawyers in the death penalty? I'm, I'm thinking a couple things. One is that in Glossop, uh, one of the sort of overlooked things in the opinion is that uh, lawyers are actually, in effect, required to prove an alternative, which puts a defense lawyer, uh, somebody representing somebody, in a very awkward situation. And that, that's a very specific sort of instance of uh, how, how a, a lawyer would handle that, that kind of a situation when they're representing a client, kind of turns the adversary system on its head in some ways. And then, but then also, you know, the physicians have already said we're not going to be a part of this anymore, essentially. And so what is the role of the, uh, when, you, when you have a situation where the pharmaceutical companies have already said they don't want to be a part of this, what is the role and the obligation of the lawyer generally in this issue? Well, um, you know, I haven't really thought about that question from that perspective. Um, that, uh, but... You know, in an adversary system, you know, obviously the lawyer for the defendant's got to do everything the lawyer can on behalf of the defendant. I'd be hard pressed to come to the conclusion that the lawyer would be violating the ethics of the legal profession by representing the state in one of these cases. Um, you know, you can make a moral judgment as an individual that you don't want anything to do with this, it seems to me. Um, but, but it doesn't seem to me that that would be unethical as a legal matter to represent your client um, if you're working for the government. I have, I have a hard time getting my head around the idea that that would be um, inconsistent with your ethical obligations as a lawyer. In the way. So it just seems different to me than with respect to physicians. Um, and then pharmaceutical companies are making whatever judgments they make. Um, the thing I'm going to answer, your, sort of take your question a little bit of a different direction. Um, the last case I did um, involving somebody on death row um, presented a different kind of dilemma as a lawyer, I thought, but one that I thought was really hard to wrestle with. It was a case called Monteo against Louisiana, um, a Sixth Amendment case. And um, I got asked, uh, it was direct appeal from a, a state Supreme Court. And I got asked if I would do the cert petition. And uh, there was a particular Sixth Amendment doctrine. I can't even remember now the case, Edwards maybe, um, that, uh, no, Jackson, no, Jackson. Jackson was the case, right? Where I knew that if Jackson applied, this guy would win, and that there was, in fact, a split in the circuits on the application of Jackson in this situation. So I knew it was a pretty good candidate for cert, and if Jackson applied, that, uh, that this guy, Montejo, would win. And I thought that there was about a 75% chance that Jackson would be overruled if <laughs> this case went up. So like, what do you do in that situation? Um, and, you know, sort of in terms of thinking about the role of the lawyer, you know, and so I laid this out for the, the lawyers in Louisiana I was working with, and I laid this out for the, you know, they, they laid it out for the client, and they decided they wanted to go forward. So we went forward, and I, I argued. It was the last thing I did right before I went to the government in 2009. It was in January. And sure enough, you know, I argued it, and I tied them up in knots completely, and that if Jackson was going to apply, we were definitely going to win. And then I went into the government, and like three weeks after I went into the government, the court issued a, a supplemental order asking for briefing on whether Jackson should be overruled. And then sure enough, they did overrule Jackson. And, you know, I thought about that. Um, and it's sort of like I'm thinking about it because I'm thinking about this, what we're calling Furman II here, you know. And, you know, as a lawyer for an individual capital defendant, if that, you know, 
if you've got a shot and that's your only shot for the defendant, then, you know, maybe you've got to take that issue up. Um, but it may be like the wrong time to do it, you know, and, that, and that's sort of that, that Jackson issue was like that for me. It was like I knew exactly where this was headed. Um, but they, you know, it was, it was really the client's best chance you know, maybe only chance, and so we, we took it, but it worked out exactly as I'd feared it would. I, I just thought that was like, in terms of thinking about the role of the lawyer in these kinds of cases, I don't know, I found that really hard, really hard. So. Yeah, this picks up on a discussion we had for those of you who were here this morning talking about the difference between being a lawyer for an individual client and a movement lawyer, and you might make different decisions in, in, in the context of talking about uh, Tony Amsterdam and in the uh, LDF litigation leading up to Furman and Gregg and the questions that faced him as a movement lawyer also representing individual clients. These are some tough eth ethical issues. Um, uh, I mean, they're not tough in the sense that the ethics are very clear. You do what's good for your client, but what if you represent a bunch of clients? And uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. Yeah. And it's a, you, crisply brought it to, to light with uh, the Monteo example. Uh, thank you so much sure. for making yourself great. available. Great. Really Please happy join to be me. here. Thank you.